Genesis 32, verse 24, reading to about verse 29. The King James Version is my translation this morning. You know, Jacob is the black sheep of the family, of the royal family. He has a unique propensity to always get himself into trouble and creating embarrassing situations for himself and the family. He's the fellow who always gets his foot in his mouth. That's Jacob. He's the crooked guy. Always in trouble, Jacob. Yet God sets him in the canvas of the brilliance of his father and grandfather, Abraham and Isaac. And this now allows God to use his life to paint the picture of magnificent grace. God uses the least likely to do the most mighty. And this gives others great hope that you can be in a mess up, a total reject and a colossal failure, and God will not give up on you. And Jacob is proof positive that God doesn't give up on crazy people. And so I have a chance. <laughs> Genesis 32 verse 24. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw, when God saw, God was the man that wrestled with him, that Jacob prevailed, or rather that God prevailed not against Jacob. God touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, the place of his support. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with Jacob. God said, let me go for the day breaketh. It's a deadline. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, Hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed? And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou ask after my name? And God blessed him there. The book of Proverbs elucidates profundity and wisdom in strands. So that individually, the ways that are there, the proverbs that are there, can stand alone. But they're often strung together as a string of pearly wisdom from which we can learn much about life. And I read in your hearing the fifth and the sixth verses only. Open rebuke is better than secret love faithful are the wounds of a friend friend wounds me mm. but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful Look for about four or five neighbors and tell them the pain is for good. Father, bless this moment. Release your presence. Release purpose. Change us. Don't only challenge us. And use me instrumentally in this moment as I yield to the sovereign power, purpose, and intelligence of the Holy One, Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. And the people of God said a very big amen. Slap somebody a high five. Tell them the pain is for good. Amen. Tell somebody else, I know it hurts, but it's good for you. The title of my subject this morning, The Pain is for Good, sounds like an oxymoron. 
Because to put these two opposites together, pain and good, sounds antithetical to each other. But life is full of oxymorons. And when you consider the word pain and reflect on its meaning, it generally conjures up what you don't like, what you want to refrain yourself from, what you don't want to go through. Pain refers to the things that happen when you have a bloody accident or the loss of a loved one or bereavement because somebody very dear to you has departed or a, a broken heart from a jilted relationship. Whilst good is often associated with joy, with niceties, with pleasantness, with pleasure, with things that are nice to you. Good is, is not often associated with pain. So when you talk about pain being good, it sounds oxymoronic, such as the wise king Solomon declared to us in, in the 27th chapter and 6th verse of the ways that are there. And he said, faithful are the wounds of a friend. My question then arises, how can wounds be faithful? And what is a friend doing wounding or causing pain to his friend. And evidently, the writer of the book of Proverbs wants us to understand on a deeper level the meaning of true friendship. And most people that I know do not really understand the meaning of true friendship. Many people do not understand friendship and they often confuse it with flattery. They think that good friends are the people who always and only say what they want to hear. However, I have learned that people say what you want to hear because they do not feel you are valuable enough for them to invest in you the energy required to endure your wrath when they tell you the truth about something that you're doing wrong. And instead, they would rather refrain themselves and tell you what they think you want to hear and as a result they they subvert you and send you down the wrong path and watch you slowly kill or ruin yourself and destiny whilst they withhold the truth from you to be a friend is a real investment it requires commitment enough that you are willing to face the wrath of a friend offended by the truth that you have told them so that in the short run you may have to encounter the offense of a friend whom you have told the truth, but in the long run, he'll come back to you some months or some years or some weeks later to say, thank you. It was good for me that you hurt my feelings, but in hurting my feelings, you didn't hurt me. Because it's one thing for your feelings to be hurt, it's another thing for you or your destiny to be hurt. And often to preserve your destiny, your feelings do need to be hurt. <laughs> I once saw a large woman who was endowed with a lot of flab. She couldn't have weighed anything less than 300 pounds. And she had the flab in folds, large folds. But if you weren't careful, you could mistake the folds for tires. And her misfortune was that she... You know, clothes can be very forgiving. You know, I know how to use clothes to hide a pot belly and to hide those things they call love handles and they can make you look much smarter and much more together than you really are. But the, the, the clothes she chose to, wear on that, to wear on that particular day, there was nothing forgiving about them. They didn't justify her, but instead they revealed the ugliness of her peculiar flab. That one observer says, oh, poor girl. She evidently doesn't have a mirror and certainly doesn't have a real friend. Because the one thing about a mirror is a mirror will tell you the truth. And she certainly didn't have that, but the poor girl didn't have a mirror and she certainly didn't have a friend. There's sometimes when I've worn the wrong stuff and it just didn't go together, it did the wrong thing to me and didn't justify me at all. My wife will pull me back by the car. You ain't going out of the house like that. 
And likewise, sometimes she might not be aware that she's added a few pounds in certain areas of her pulchritude. And I say, honey, you ain't going out of my house like that. You, my wife, you the metropolitan mama. <laughs> and I'll make her allow me to be late for a, an important function while she goes back to her wardrobe to look for something that is more appropriate for her roles. Hmm. The illustration serves a good point for the simple reason that when you don't have a real friend who can tell you what's really going on with you and who, who can give you a genuine observer's remarks on what's going on in your life, you are liable to keep doing something stupid. And sometimes because you don't have 360 degrees view, it's the things that you don't see that ruin your future. That's why a friend is a precious thing to have. But unfortunately, our generation has confused friendship with flattery. Especially if you're the big guy, or you're visible, or you are influential, or you're affluential, you will attract psychophants to you. And psychophants want favor from you, and they want to share in your influence, so they're only going to massage your ego and tell you the stuff that you, they think you want to hear. And you confuse their flattery for friendship. Whereas their friendship, or rather their flattery, is foolishness. It's evidence to the trained scholar or the trained person that they are really only out to get what they can get from your affluence, your influence, or your favor. But they don't really care about you. Oh, help me and ask about three or four people around you. Are you a real friend or are you just a flatterer? Because when you really want to go somewhere powerful with your life, somewhere purposeful, somewhere preordained by God for what he originally created you to be and do, you are going to need real friends and not flatterers. And as you get older, you begin to go through the inventory of the list of people that are in your circle of interaction, relationship, and talk. And after a while, you begin to scratch certain names up because you recognize that that Negro is not a friend. You hear what I'm saying to you? I hope, I hope we're beginning to talk. I'm going somewhere and I'm going to need some time. So can we talk some more? Because it bothers me, my friends, when people tell you that you look good when you don't. Or that they tell you, Pastor, you did well when you didn't. And those kind of false compliments don't help you because now I can't tell when you're telling the truth or when you're telling a lie. So that even when I do good, you tell me that I do good, but I don't trust you because when I did bad, you told me I did good. So you're not a reliable observer. You need truth tellers to be your real friends. Otherwise, you can't tell when you did well or when you didn't do well. And when you do well, you won't believe them because they don't, you don't trust them. The writer here in the book of Proverbs wants us to come into a deeper understanding of friendship. And wants us to separate it from flattery. Because often the people who love you will say things to you that you don't like. And the people who don't like you will often say things to you that they think you want to hear. Whilst the Bible tells us that the kisses of an enemy are deceivers. And he also tells us that faithful are the wounds of a friend. You want to tell who's faithful to you? Find out who tells you the truth. Even when they know it's going to hurt you and are willing to risk relationship with you. Because their interest is not your feelings. Not that they are disinterested, but their interest is your future, your preservation, your protection, your destiny, the fulfillment of God's purpose in your life. And when they recognize that you are going a certain way that will jeopardize who you are in God and who you're meant to become in Christ. They're happy to tell you 
not because they want to hurt your feelings, but they're willing to risk the hurt of your feelings in order to preserve you. So they hurt you without hurting you. They hurt your feelings without hurting who you are. Are you here, somebody? So sometimes those kisses who are grinning and loving on you are not friends but enemies. It was with a kiss that Judas sent Jesus to the cross. So don't believe all those people grinning at you because most of them are not happy for you. They, 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 they are not really there for you because they wish it was them and not you. I remember when we had the first big, big experience and a gentleman who came from far away to be part of the experience, he saw all kinds of big boys and big folk and big preachers around and they were smiling at Paul Adifar, just smiling, smiling, smiling. He said, Paul, let me tell you something. All these folk who are smiling at you and smiling with you, most of them are not with you. They're with your influence, they're with your favor, but they're not with you. Their smile is not real. And they're going to keep telling you the things you want to hear, but that's not how you discern your friends. Can I talk to you a little bit? In this treacherous day in which we live, you need discernment. That means if you are not baptized with the Holy Ghost, I beg you, hurry up and get baptized in the Holy Ghost quickly because he will give you discernment to be able to tell the difference between a friend and an enemy. Let me tell you something about an enemy. You, they don't have the word written enemy on their forehead. In fact, the enemy does the things that you think a friend ought to do and you are liable to keep on mistaking your friends for your enemies and your enemies for your friends. <laughs> What I'm teaching you this morning, it can make the difference between whether you make it to the fulfillment of your purpose or whether you crash and burn prematurely. And let me tell you something before I go too much further. I believe that God has a calendar. And on that calendar, he has deadlines that you must come to certain levels and certain places and certain characteristics of maturity before the deadline. And when he wants to get you to become what he wants you to become before the deadline, he sometimes has to change the rules of how he engages you. And what I've come to learn, my brothers and my sisters, my mothers and my fathers, my sons and my daughters, of all the friends I have, whew, there is one. There is one who is the real friend, the Proverbs 25, or rather Proverbs 27, verse 6, talks about. Who is faithful to hurt my feelings so that I don't get hurt. Who's faithful to wound me so that my destiny is not wounded. By the way, that's also the kind of pastor you need. By the way, that's also the kind of spouse that you need in your house. Whilst he or she's meant to be the lover of your body, you need somebody who's going to be the lover of your soul. Can we talk some more? Jesus is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. In my own life, I have found God to be a constant and true and closest friend. Unfortunately, too many Christians only see God as sovereign, and yes, he is. They only see him as supreme, and yes, he is. They only see him as absolute, and yes, he is. They only see him as judge, and yes, he is. But as a result, they miss out on the opportunity of embracing him as a genuine friend. The one who rides to church with you in the car and drives to work with you in the car. The one who's with you in the salon. The one who's there with you in the kitchen whilst you're cooking your foie legushi. He's the one who's with you whilst you're lying down in bed and you're traumatized over your circumstances. And he gives you counsel from the rich repository of his wisdom as the ancient of days. You, my friends, need to have an intimate relationship with God that takes him off the throne in glory and puts him on the chair in your living room as an intimate friend and counselor and i'm not talking about that churchy god that churchy god that when you come to the house 
Or you, you do that fun, funky thing that you do or that, that churchy God that makes you so ba, 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 ba. No, I'll change that churchy God. I'll exchange that churchy God for a God who comes into my living room and walks with me and talks with me and drives with me and tells me that I am his own. I'll exchange that, that God on a big throne highway in, in lofty sides of the north for a God who's with me in my trouble. Who talks me through my turmoil? Who talks me out of my madness? Who uh, uh, finds out exactly what's going wrong with me and is willing to talk to me about what's stupid in my life? Hmm. In a hurry, I would exchange that churchy God for the kind of God who is a friend in my daily business, who will tell me off when I am about to do something stupid, who's with me in my failures, in my valleys, in my fiery furnaces, in my troubled waters, who's with me in my fiery trials. I'm talking about a God who is not merely involved in my functionality, but a God who is more involved with my dysfunction. Dysfunction is the stuff that isn't working in your life. Or something that isn't working right or something that's working for the wrong reason. And what I, what I want to tell you before I go much further this morning is please don't hide your dysfunction from your God. He's the only one who can fix it. Adam, where are you? God said, oh, Adam said, I, I hit myself. You know why men hide themselves? Men love darkness because their deeds were evil. They would not come into the light. And what men don't understand is that when your deeds are evil and you, therefore you don't like the light, you hide in the darkness. Darkness is the devil's playground. Privacy, isolation is the playground of the enemy. And what you need to do, instead of hiding your dysfunction from God, please hide it from some people. Otherwise, they'll take your stuff and put it on the internet. But when it comes to God, don't hide your dysfunction from your God. He's the only one who can fix it. He's the only one who will tell you the truth about it. And no matter what the dysfunction is, it will not disqualify you from being his friend. The reason why he's your friend is because he wants to fix you. And Adam covered himself up with fig leaves and said, I was hiding, I was hiding. I'm hiding because I, I was afraid. Well, look at three or four people, tell them, come out of hiding. Oh, don't tell them like you're whispering to somebody. I want you to tell them like a real friend. Shout at them, tell them, come out of hiding. It might destroy your future, your economy, your marriage, your house. Come out of hiding. Hiding fornication, hiding adultery, hiding debauchery, hiding philandering, hiding lying and cheating, hiding homosexuality, hiding lesbianism, hiding from foolery. Get out of hiding. Otherwise, the more you hide it, the more it develops. And the more it develops, the more likely it is going to destroy you. He was hiding. You know, they don't only hide behind fig leaves. The new fig leaves are scriptures. They hide behind scriptures. They hide behind these masks. In fact, if Nollywood is getting ready to release their next premiere movie, and they're looking for talent to help them act out various characters, let me tell you where they should come to. Come to the church. Because that's where the best actors are. Acting blessed. Acting fulfilled, acting happy, acting like they got it going on, acting acting holy, acting godly, acting full of the Holy Ghost, but it's really just an act. And you begin to wonder, why are they acting? The reason why they're acting is because they feel that if they really showed you who they really were, you might not like them anymore. Now give two people an elbow on either side. Tell them he must be talking about you right now because he's not talking about me. <laughs> and then just look at your neighbor and say it with a hilarious voice. Say, actor. That's what the church has become. 
place where we don't transform, but instead we pretend to what we ought to be transforming into. And we never give the people transformation meat. Instead, we provoke them to pretend because we don't take them through the process of unveiling themselves and understanding the true import of having a real friendship with God and with genuine people of God who will be faithful enough to wound your feelings so that they can preserve your destiny. <sighs> I feel something in this place. I can see you thinking. Don't come and tell me I did good. <laughs> if I didn't. <laughs> Adam was hiding. I want to show you an important principle. You've got to come out of hiding, but I want to show you an important principle. After listening at the sycophants, who constantly say nice things to you that they never meant, you eventually come to a place where you don't even trust yourself anymore, let alone them. And you go to that list of friends that you have, especially when you get to my kind of age, 50 plus, you start scratching people off from that list. I thought you loved me, but I realize after reading Proverbs that you don't. I thought you were my friend, but after Solomon started talking in my head through his Proverbs, I realized that you are not. I thought that I could trust you after I heard all the nice things you would say about me, but after understanding the difference between friendship and flattery, I realized that I can't trust you at all. I thought that I could depend on you to tell me the truth, to be a mirror in my life. But after Solomon got in my thinking, I realized that I can't depend on you at all either. Shh. I thought you understood me, but I realize now that you don't. Until finally, the list gets so small, and now you are where Jacob was in Genesis 32. Left alone with God because there was not one person left in your life who was genuinely a true friend hmm. look at somebody and say you know I think that's true today's message by the way is not for everybody it's for people who have been to hell and back who've been through all kinds of trouble, trial, been betrayed, uh, been hurt by all kinds of folk, all kinds of damage done to them, and they've come to a place of exasperation like the young lady sang about, where, like David, they say, all men are liars. Or like Apostle Paul of Tarsus, let every man be a liar. Only God is true. Because they got to a place where they realized that people were just psychophants. They weren't helping you. They weren't massaging your ego, but they were hurting your possibility. How could a man as gifted, as talented as Jacob, as privileged as Jacob, end up all alone? Before we talk about how God wrestled with Jacob, I must first talk about the struggle of being alone and by the way you can have thousands of people serenading you and surrounding you and yet be alone because aloneness is not measured by how many people are around you or how many people are not around you aloneness is measured by how many people around you don't understand what it feels like to be you going through what you're going through so in spite of all the people you have in your circles of friends there's nobody you can really talk to about being you so you can't unveil yourself, you can't be vulnerable, you can't strip naked for them to see where it hurts and where the pain is and where the problem is. And as a result, you feel alone. This is the plight of mega church pastors, of big businessmen, of captains of industry, of first ladies, the big associations, big organizations, people who have made it in life. This is their struggle. Because everybody wants something from you, but they don't really care about you. And you know, you have to watch me, because I can tell a friend from a long way away. 
I can also tell an enemy if when they're blowing you kisses and laying rose petals on your pathway. Can I tell you? There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. A brother normally will tell you the truth because he's not afraid of you, he's not intimidated by you, but there's a friend that can be closer than a brother. And that friend, the Bible tells us, he is Jesus. And after Jacob was left alone, everybody had left him. He was alone with God. It's a struggle to be alone. And alone doesn't mean you're single because you can be married and be alone. Alone doesn't mean you don't have close people. But what it does mean is that all the close people around you don't really understand you. You can be passing marmalade on toast over tea with your spouse in the house and yet be alone. Because there's some things you can go through that no matter how intelligent or no matter how much she loves you or he loves you, they may not understand. Because there are certain problems that are unique to you that nobody else but the lover of your soul can understand. You hear what I'm saying? That even when you try to tell her, there's no way she'll ever understand it. <laughs> because she's not you. This is a problem that only God can fix. And God created the problem because it's going to be the platform upon which he enters into your life to fulfill a predetermined destiny that he promised to your grandfather Abraham, promised to your father Isaac, and must fulfill in your life about this time. And Jacob, you're no longer on schedule. You're late. So I may have to work quicker than I have done in the past. That's what God says. Look at three or four people. Tell them I get a feeling that you're not on schedule, you're behind time. Because when you're behind time, it means that God is getting ready to wrestle with you. He's getting ready to wrestle with you. He's not the kind of God who's going to come and placate you and massage your ego and stroke, stroke your feathers the right way. No, no. He's too much of a lover to be nice. He's too much of a lover to not be a wrestler. Thank God for the people who would tell you the truth. That for your stature and for who you are in the community, you should be far above adultery by now. You should be far above fornication. You should be far above this. You should be far above that. Stop being stupid. Only a friend is willing to invest the energy in you enough to correct you even though he does so at the risk of your wrath. Because what he's really interested in is your destiny and he's willing to endure your wrath for a season knowing that what he sows will later produce your destiny and you'll be thankful to him that he told you the truth and had the effrontery, the energy, the love to do so. Now most human beings will not take that position with you. Especially when it's a serious issue. And if you don't have a friend in God, and you have the issue, of all men, you are most miserable. One of the real marks of sonship to God is that he corrects you. In fact, he says if you don't allow him to correct you, he views you as a bastard. I didn't say that, he did. The Lord chasteneth them that he loveth. And if he doesn't chasten you, he sees you as illegitimate. In fact, when you're a real son, what you come to your father to tell him is, how am I really doing? And all these folk, they tell me I'm doing good, they tell me I'm fantastic, but I want you, because you have deeper eyes, you have keener insight. You tell me, how am I really doing? Every real son wants his real father to tell him, who am I? Because nobody else can name you but your daddy. I'm wondering why, in fact, I am perturbed by your silence. I'm disturbed by it. I'm 
Jacob was left alone. Alone but fighting for his life. Alone but fighting for the next breath to breathe. Alone and trying to keep his head above water. Alone trying to get up out of bed in the morning because it had become difficult with all his issues. And then people are still talking about you and looking at you like as if there's something wrong with you. Yet, my friends, in spite of all they say about you, they wish they were in your shoes. And they don't know, they have no idea what it costs to be you. On the outside, you look enviable, you look like you, you're everything they would want to be. But if you really showed them what you have to go through, they'd run away in a half, in a half moment. He's left alone, all by himself. Nobody to talk to. Because how, how can the governor's wife tell anybody about her problems? How does the president's wife or the CEO's wife tell subordinates about the marital issues? Left alone. Who does she counsel with? If she talks to another big preacher somewhere down the road, they're going to use the information to try and kill the ministry. If they talk to, to, to the other psalmist or big singer somewhere, they're going to use the information to pull him down so they can take his space. Left alone. Sometimes, my friend, nobody knows where you are except God. And I'm not talking about your geographical address. They may know where you live, but still not know where you are. Job said it this way, even when I can't perceive God, the Lord knows the way that I take. And after I've been tried in the fire, I will come forth as pure gold. Because the place that God knows where you are, it's not a physical address, it's not a geographical location, it's what's happening on the inside of you that even the people closest to you don't know anything about. Jacob walked up onto a rocky mountain all by himself and there was nobody around who knew where he was except God. He was left alone. Everybody has left him. But God knows where he is. He knows what's going through your mind. He knows what troubles your soul at 3 a.m. in the morning. He knows what even your own spouse in your own house has no idea of. He, passing the jam and the marmalade. Passing the tea and the toast. And yet she doesn't know where you are. Laying in bed beside somebody and they don't know where you are. Because only God truly knows where you are. Only God knows where you are. Why? Because we are actors. Acting happy. How are you? Fine, 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 fine. But the truth be told, you're not fine, 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 fine. So we turn after we've found no solace or succor in the people around us who really don't know who we are or where we are. We eventually turn to the lover of our souls. The soul is the place where human touch and human kisses cannot reach. The soul is where pain and brokenness live. The soul is where memories and, and the stuff that, that we don't want to talk to anybody about lives. And God says, that's the part I want. Give me that part. That's the part that you don't want to talk about, but that's the part I want to talk to about with you. God is the lover of my soul. Anybody can find a lover for their body, but only one person can genuinely be the lover of your soul. Just like with all lovers, the lover of your soul wants you by yourself. You know how it is when you're with your lover and other guests come by because you made dinner for them and instead of spending the two hours that you allotted to dinner, they want to just hang out and be around for four or five hours. But you say, no, baby, you can't be here longer than the allotted time. You can pack the turkey and the isiewu. You can pack the ofinsala. You can put it in this little bag here, but you got to go because when lovers get into their love thing, they want to be all by themselves. Jacob! was left alone with his lover, the lover of his soul. Because when it's time to get intimate and to strip down and show your nakedness, you don't need anybody else but the people you can trust to be there with you. Jacob was left alone 
with the lover of his soul. A careful study of the text reveals that the lover of his soul was actually, actually a theophanic uh, manifestation of the pre-incarnate God. Simply put, that just means that God showed up as an angel before he became Christ. And this is how he showed himself to Moses in the burning bush, how he showed himself to Joshua before the battle, and how he shows himself to Jacob in this theophanic manifestation. And the story reveals that we have a wrestling God. So he's not just a lover, but he's a wrestler. And maybe he's a good wrestler because he's a good lover. Because a good lover also has to be a good wrestler. It's easy to find somebody who loves you enough to embrace you physically. But it's hard to find somebody who loves you enough to wrestle with you. To wrestle with you. Uh, come, Tyria, for a moment. Wrestling with him. Give me a few blows. Don't really hit me. Uh, we're wrestling. We're wrestling. And God started wrestling with Jacob. Hold it, Tyria. Don't go anywhere. Notice, the Bible didn't say that Jacob was wrestling with God. It said God was the one wrestling with Jacob. And... If you look at the text closely, it said God realized that he couldn't or wasn't prevailing against Jacob. That means Jacob was stubborn. The God had been warning him for a long time, but he was refusing to listen. That meant Jacob was cautioned by God, but Jacob was so hard of hearing, so stubborn, so stiff-necked that he refused to hearken. And he kept exchanging with God and wrestling with the lover of his soul. And the lover of his soul was tenacious enough to remain in the fight. In other words, Jacob, I'm not going to let you go till I fix you. I'll wrestle you, I'll wound you if I have to, because I got to fix you because I have plans for your life. Just in case you don't know it, Jacob, I made a promise to Abraham. I didn't make the promise to Abraham because I thought Abraham was good. I made the promise to Abraham because Abraham would become the instrument that I would use to establish my kingdom, my purpose, and my covenant on the earth. And I knew that I couldn't do it all in his lifetime. That I'd have to use his generations. And that's how you came into the picture. Daddy eventually became a good guy and so did your granddaddy. But I'm struggling with you. You are not supposed to be the lying, scoundrel, unscrupulous wretch that you are. Now, you should have transformed a long time ago. And that's why, because I have a deadline, I have to fix you before tomorrow morning. I want to prophesy to somebody. You are going to go through a bad fight with God in the month of March. A bad fight. And if you don't understand Proverbs 27 and verse 6, you will misunderstand the fight to feel like as if God is trying to ruin you, but God is really trying to reach you. He's trying to make you. And that fight will be so severe. And if you remain stubborn, God is still going to win the fight. Because God can win the fight over a yielded person, but he can also win the fight over a stubborn person. He has many ways that he fights. I didn't call him a wrestler. I called him a good wrestler. So he's exchanging blows with him. He's exchanging blows. And I'm coming back to the prophecy. He's exchanging blows. And, and God is disturbed that I'm arguing with this guy and he's arguing back. I'm trying to mess his feelings up so that he can get right with me and get right with his purpose but this is a tough nut slap somebody a high five tell them tough nut you are i can't get you to stop drinking i can't get you to stop smoking i can't get you to start praying i can't get you to stop lying i can't stay, get you to start reading your bible you are tough nut Wrestling you, putting you through pain and injury here and there to get you to learn a new dependence on something other than yourself. I'm not getting through to you. Been wrestling him from sundown through the midnight hour, through the early morning hours till 3 a.m. in the morning. It's now 4 a.m. in the morning. The night is almost completely spent and Jacob is still stubborn. 
Look at somebody. Just point at them and say, stubborn you. Now, by the way, don't go anywhere, Terry, Jacob. By the way, if I don't fix Jacob now, he will never have victory over his twin, Esau. So I've got to fix him. And when God saw that the deadline was on him, that it's going to be breaking of day and the new era for his life would begin so that my purpose for his family line, which is the platform upon which my purpose for the earth will be issued forth, can find fulfillment. And I'm so close to the breaking of day that I can't keep wrestling a guy who I can't beat. I can't beat Jacob. I can't beat him. So I'm going to change the rules. Shh. And what happens? Jacob loses his structure. And he cannot stand on his own feet. So instead of fighting, he starts clinging. Instead of fighting, he starts clinging. What's happening to many of us in this room this morning is that we are fighting God instead of clinging to God. And your power, your purpose, your promise, your destiny, your future is never in the fight. It's in the clinging. Slap three people a high five and tell them, you want to know my secret? I'm clinging. The reason why I'm anointed is sing like Samuel Kosos because I'm a clinger. The reason why I can take the notes to high points and drop the anointing of God into the house like Gloria Brimo is because I'm a clinger. The reason why I can do this the way I do this like Kike Loma Balogu is because I'm a clinger. God hit me where my support was. The things I depended on, I got hit there so I can't depend on my structure. I have to depend on God. I can't fight him anymore. I have to cling to him. Because if I don't cling to him, my legs can't support me. I'll fall out. He is my legs now. Some of you, something very significant to your structure, your ability to stand has taken a hit. Others of you, it's about to take a hit because God is tired of fighting with you. He wants you to become a clinger and not a fighter. You hear what I'm saying? <sighs> Wants you to become a clinger. And he's in a hurry now. God is in a hurry. Because there's a deadline. And if you don't make the deadline with the new you, then that means God's plan for the earth, for Nigeria, for Egypt, for Ethiopia, for New Zealand, for Australia, for America, for the UK, is going to fall out of sorts. So I have to fix you, otherwise my grand plan will not get started. So God says, I'm changing the fight. And he changed the nature of the fight. He changed it so quickly. And boom, he hit him. And in that moment, Jacob ceased to be a fighter and became a clinger. How many clingers do we have here? You're clinging on to God. Because everything in your life, they can't see it. But you know it, it's fallen apart. The center can't hold. Everything in your economy has fallen out from the bottom. Nothing is holding together any longer. You know why? Because God hit you somewhere. It wasn't the devil. The devil tells you nice things that you got it going on. You're the best thing since, since sliced bread. You're better than ice water. You're lovely. Nobody's as nice as you, as good as you. You're the most anointed preacher in the whole world. The devil's a liar like that, you know. You're the most handsome. You're the most beautiful. You're the this, you're the that. That's how he does you. You're the best consultant in the whole world. <laughs> Nobody can do it like you. You're the best. You're the man. Then he'll rub your back and then send people to rub your back for him. And then you go around believing it and you don't realize you're walking to your destruction. But a real friend will see you about to kill yourself and say, stop it, stupid, and risk 
your wrath to save your destiny, to save your purpose. There he was, clinging. I don't know about you, but I want to confess I'm a clinger. Because if the truth ever gets out about me, I'm finished. For all the stuff that you don't know about me, that happens in the privacy of the isolation of the sequester of my private mind, if it ever got out and manifested itself, I'd be ruined. Then I have to cling to God before Esau comes out instead of Jacob. For the bad twin comes out instead of the good twin. So I'm clinging to him because he's the only one who can help me to keep that bad twin under control. And he's holding on to him. And God said, leave me alone, leave me alone. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Because he realized that I don't have anything anymore. What I used to depend on, that leg, it's a bad leg now. You have to bless me. And guess how God blessed him, mom? God blessed him by asking him a question. What is your reputation? What is the real truth about you? What do people really call you? Not the folk who are sucking up to you for what they can get, but the people who want to tell you how it really is. What's your real reputation? He said, I'm a thief. I'm a 419. That's what Jacob means. It means supplanter. It means for an, I'm a 419. He said, oh my God. That's my reputation. That's all the name is. What people call you. Sometimes they're just polite to you when they call you the name that your parents called you at birth. But behind your, behind your, your, your view, they talk about you. And how they talk about you is how you are named or how you are reputed. And Jacob had a bad reputation. He, he, he swerved his, his father-in-law. He swerved his brother. He swerved his daddy. He swerved his wives. He swerved himself. And he was trying to swerve God. When jungle mature, he who know, no go know. And when God confronted him with who he really was, God looked at him and he said, no longer will your name be Jacob. For thou hast power with God and with man. I'm changing your reputation. I'm going to do something about you that intrinsically does not depend on you, but depends on me. And by that, I will bring about a true internal transformation that will have external manifestation. I'm going to change your reputation by changing your inward makeup. And that's why I had to wrestle with you till you came to the end of yourself so you could come to the beginning of God. And God blessed him thus, and Jacob was a changed man. Thank you. And Jacob is limping, but he's smiling. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be blessed with a limp than be cursed with a swagger. And the worst thing about this limp, Ozioma, is that this limp is not a limp that goes away after two months or two weeks or two days. This is a lifetime limp. You're going to be carrying the sign of this injury for all your life. And God, how can I consider you a friend? The best friend when you've given me an injury that's going to last me for all my lifetime. My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren are going to say, Daddy, what happened to you? And I'm going to have to tell them what it was. And I'm meant to consider you my friend, God. I would have considered God to be my enemy if I didn't read the wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs 27, verse 6. Faithful! Faithful are the wounds of a friend. So that I will always have a reminder of how stupid it is to be stubborn with a wrestling God. And it, it particularly hurts when I'm trying to go up in life.
But, but after a while, the wound gets healed, but the limp doesn't go. And how I know that I'm healed is that it doesn't hurt anymore, even though I'm still limping. I wonder if there are any limpers in here. See, that's the, that's the dynamic of House on the Rock. House on the Rock doesn't attract two good-legged people or people with two good legs. I know your secret. I know your secret. The reason why you like this church and like this anointing and like this word is no matter how you dress up or how you drive up or how you wear up or how you live up or how you house up, I know you got a bad leg. That's what makes us fraternal to one another. That's what gives us a sense of brotherhood. You can wear a nice tie, a nice suit, put on a weave on, put a wig, put on some boo 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 perfume, drive up in a nice Mercedes or a Volvo, but baby, I know you got a bad leg. And I know where you got it from. You got it from your stupid stubbornness. But what I also know he said, God has such a powerful purpose and a promise on your life. And that's why he loved you enough to wrestle with you till he broke your leg to let you know that lean not to your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge the Lord and he will not only direct, but he'll fulfill your destiny. Let me tell you what has progressed me the most in my life. Was two things. The people who genuinely loved me and as a result had real access, not to me, but to my heart and were willing to tell me the truth in love. And number two, the more important, God is my best friend. Stuff you would never dare to tell me. He can tell me. He can confront me anytime. And even if I'm stubborn, I say, no, you got, you got it wrong. He'll be with me through the night. But before the day, the new day, the new hour breaks, he'll break something. I want to tell somebody that in March, God is about to change the nature of your fight with him. Amen. That means you've been trading blows with him. He ain't trading blows with you anymore. He's going to hit you where you won't have a blow left. But when he hurts you there, He's not really hurting you because you can hurt me without hurting me. You can hurt my feelings without hurting who I am. When Jacob came off that mountain with that bad leg, he came out of that experience on the mountain with God. Knowing who he really was now. Because prior to that, he did not know who he was. He was what his mommy and his daddy called him. He was what his community called him. But it was for God to call him what he created him for. And it's only in the wrestling match. Come here, Terrier. It's only in the wrestling match that God can change your image, your reputation, and your reality. Because you become such a lousy scoundrel. But that's not what I created you to be. You let your bad twin determine your character. And so I'm going to come in now and break something so I can show you who you really are in me. He said, you're not that scoundrel. You're my prince. You're the one on whom I'm going to ride into Israel and change the status quo. You're the one I'm going to use to proliferate the nation and create 12 tribes that will become the holy nation of God. You're the one I'm going to use. It's you. And that means that before this is over, I'm going to change you. And all of a sudden, Jacob started loving God. And guess what? Right after this encounter, he went to meet Esau. And he sorted Esau out once and for all time. Bam! Because he now knew who he was. Look at three or four people. Slap them a half. I tell them the pain is good. Thank you, Tyria. 
I know I hurt you when I took your daddy back to glory, but the pain is good. Isaiah, I know it hurt you when I took your king, Uzziah, back to glory, but the pain is good. I know it hurt you to see your husband die and to be a widow now, but the pain is good. I know it was terrible, one miscarriage after the other, and you buried three like that, but the pain is good. Because to be a good lover, you have to be a good wrestler. And you'll never find a better lover than God. Because he'll wrestle you till he changes who you are into what he created you to be. She's so afraid of you because you're a tyrannical husband. Because you got all the money and she depends on you for the money. So she can't tell you the truth. That means you're in for a prime fight with God. Because you wouldn't let who he put in the fight with you fight you. So he has to come fight you himself. <laughs> See, when your associates and your board can't tell you the truth because you're a tyrant, God's going to be your board partner. But one of the real signs that you trust God and that he's your best friend is that you can praise him in pain. Praise him with that limb. <laughs> Dancing on one leg. Just praising him with that limb. Because even though your feelings are hurt, you recognize that your destiny is blessed. And so you're not praising him because you have no pain. You're praising him in spite of the pain because he preserved your purpose. I wonder if there's anybody here who's catching real pain. You're going through real suffering. Hey, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I have some respect for some men. I know one guy, his wife had breast cancer for 10 years or so or more. Went into about 10 years of remission. Can I be frank with you? How do you love your wife's body? When she only has the scars of where memory glands used to be. How do you withhold yourself from temptation when, you, when what you are married to can't satisfy you? That's a wound. That's a deep wound. Let me leave it alone. But I have respect for people who can take a licking and they keep on ticking. I know them because in spite of their wound and how grievous it is, they're still praising God from a sincere heart. I'm not talking about the church praise. I'm talking about praise in the midst of their pain, in the back streets of their home. Still giving him glory. In spite of the pain. Because they respect, revere, and appreciate who he is. Not to their feelings, but to who they really are. You're going to go back, I hope, and do an inventory, a history check on all, on all your fights. And wounds, whether they came through a man or if they came directly from God. Because there's a deadline. There's certain things that by the first quarter of this year, God has to have fixed in your functionality so it's no longer dysfunction but functionality. And from there, from there, he's about to start something brand new with your whole life. And in order to get you across the deadline in the right shape, spiritually, morally, he has to fight you. He has to confront some stuff that's stubborn and stupid in our lives. So that he can fix you so you become a new person by the time the sun shines in your new day onto you, the new you. So that you're clinging but still clapping. <laughs> 
so that you're clinging but still praising. So that you're limping but you're still laughing. So you're suffering but still smiling. You hear what I'm saying to you? You got to fix it. The way you treat your wife, God says, I'm through with it because you can't be my man and be a wife beater. The way you talk down at your husband, he says one, you answer 10. He says, not after March. Before the new day in your life begins, I'm going to rustle you to the ground. I'm going to fix the way you behave. That means I'm going to wound you somewhere. But when I wound you, as lifelong as the wound may be, you have to remember the faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's the flattery of an enemy that you need to be careful of. Because with a kiss, they'll send you to your cross. But with a wound, he'll send you to your destiny. There's a new day coming. And God is accelerating the fight. He's in a hurry to fix you because the new sun must not shine on your new you in a new day until he's fixed you from old to new. It's got to happen. Before this thing opened up, there's certain things that God had to deal with me about before I could come into the new page of a new lease on a new life. And I hope this resonates with you. And you don't want to listen to this tape unless you're listening to the tussle of the twins because they're partners together. They're incomplete without each other. It's things he wants to fix. He wants to take you higher, Jacob. In fact, he's going to take you so high that who you were and who you are will never be reconcilable. So he has to change your name. And he has to change it from the inside. This is not a, a publicity job. This is a transformational job. It's inward. I've got to fix you. I've got to fix you. I don't have time. So I'm not going to be trading blows and arguing with you anymore. You're, you're good at arguing, Jacob. You are a stubborn argument, man. You convince even God that you're right. You come up with all kinds of theology to tell God that he's wrong and you're right. Spend years doing it. But Jacob, I'm not taking it from you anymore. You're too important to my plan. And I use mess-ups, unscrupulous scoundrels like you. I choose the foolish things of this world to confound the wisdom of the wise. So that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of man. They'll be shocked at how enigmatic you are. And why on earth would a God like me choose to use a man like you? Because I know how to fix you. I can change you like this. But to do it, it will often cost you some real pain. I want you to rise to your feet for a few moments. God hurt you to bless you. God says, when you can't trust me, or when you can't trace me, trust me. He said, I hurt you to bless you. He says, I'm running out of time, so I have to change my strategy. Many of you, you will not end the month of March until God gets you ready for who you are in his destiny plan. He says, will you praise me in the midst of the pain? Because if you can, I'll know that you trust me. And you can laugh it off, even though it's hurting you. I know that you, you see the value of it. And therefore, you can go beyond the moment of the pain and express your praise. Hear me, there's bad pain that never helps you. But there's also good pain. The pain I'm talking about this morning is, is good pain. Pain that will make you treat your wife better. Love your husband dearer. Pain that will teach you not to be a friend to your children, but to be a parent. Some of us are too friendly to our kids. And therefore they don't get pain. They don't get discipline. They don't get faithful wounds.
I want you to grab one person by two hands for the next few minutes. And I want you to pray with her, pray with him. That God make my brother, make my sister vulnerable to you. Help my brother and my sister to come out from hiding and to come plain with you. Help my husband or my wife to find that, that private place with you where he or she can talk to you about the real issues of his or her life. Thank you for making our time to listen to this message. For additional information of this and other ministry products by Pastor Paul Adefawasin, please contact us on 01-461-4120 or 01-461-4135 or by email to info at houseontherock.org.ng You can also visit our website on www.houseontherock.org.ng God bless you. Thank you for watching today's video. This channel is brought to you by HopeLify.org to inspire you to become the very best that you were designed to be. Remember, a few simple keys, mastered and consistently applied, are often all we need to excel in each area of life. You can help make this channel even better in three simple ways. One, subscribe to receive more videos. Two, Leave a comment below to let me know what resonates with you from today's video. Or three, suggest a topic for a video that you will like for us to feature on this channel. Visit Hopelify.org to post your own inspirational content.